Bill never wanted awards or accolades. He's more or less the anti-narcissist. God knows there's a few narcissists here tonight. <laughs> but in the most humble and but effective way, the fact is he devoted his whole active working life to working people. He was in the whole thing simply for the public good of it for his genuine and conscientious service to employees, to workers, unionists and non-unionists. And of course, many of you may know that Bill had the qualifications to hit the really high spots on the other side of the fence in corporate Australia. Uh, he won the university medal. Um, he was, I think it was at Monash, wasn't it, Bill? Uh, the same year that David Morgan was there, it was always a a raw point with Morgan that Bill pipped him for the medal. But uh, David became the Deputy Secretary and, of course, CEO at Westpac. And I can tell you, the Westpac CEO's salary is much larger than the salary of the ACTU Secretary. <laughs> Quite a bit larger. <clears throat> but the fact is, Bill is an exceptionally talented person. But he's more than that. He also believes in things, in justice and equity for a start. He has an image of the world he wants to inhabit and of the society that he wants to live in. And he possesses the qualities of leadership to drive towards that vision, to see that sort of society reveal itself, to see that sort of society come about. Bill has that one quality that all effective leaders must have, and that is he is persuasive. A fair mind arrives at a considered balance in an argument or a proposition or an issue. He then makes up his mind and then presses his point to a conclusion. He was devastating in discussion. Whether in small groups or large groups, he knows how to round up the intellectual bits into a coherent story, into a compelling whole. And to watch someone like him do this over and over again, as I had the privilege of doing for so many years, just shows you what a conscientious conviction person is like when they're at their best. The trade union movement produced many impressive leaders in the post-war years, but I think none greater than Bill Kelty. <laughs> Certainly none more prepared to take responsibility for necessary change, to strike out in directions many other would otherwise be fearful of. At the end of the 1970s and early 1980s, Bill spotted the defects in the old national economic model of Australia, the old so-called defence model. The terms of trade back at post-depression levels, endemic stagflation, low growth in high inflation, the mindless pursuit of nominal rather than real increases in wages, with two wage explosions, one in 1974-5 and the other in 1979-80, a dislocation of the profit share and with it languishing private investment and, of course, with that employment, abysmal levels of productivity and falling competitiveness, no within-sector wage flexibility, only aggregate flexibility through national wage cases, a seriously outdated award structure reflecting the complexities of a declining craft age, sclerotic financial markets, a tariff structure which placed an enormous burden on working people, asking them to pay much more than they should have paid for their cars, their shoes, their shirts and the things of life. A tariff structure 
which was not just a burden, but which promoted industrial sloth in management and uncompetitiveness. Lesser union leaders would not have acknowledged the problems. The problems were so bad and so endemic. Lesser people would not have acknowledged them. In fact, most didn't. Lesser union leaders would not have had a compelling urge to face up to these issues and attempt to resolve them. But Bill Kelty's fidelity to his base, to the ACTU constituency, his conscientious interest in the real circumstances of working Australians compelled him to do it. And this is what marks Bill out as, I think, the standout figure of his period, of his age. As it turned out, with the election of the new Labor government in 1983, there was a nascent structure to deal with some of these issues, to at least discuss them, if not resolve them, and that, of course, was the Accord. But the Accord was a skeleton without muscles or a beating heart. That flesh and those organs had to be developed. But Bill had the imagination and the goodness of heart to do it, to commit himself to the development of a unique model, certainly unique in the Western world, of a conducive relationship between the organised labour force of the country and the government of the country. And as you know, over a decade and a half, certainly in my role with Bill, <clears throat> we did our best to make the Accord a success, to make it malleable, to make it adaptable, to make it useful. And in my role as Treasurer and then later Prime Minister, I could not have found a more earnest interlocutor than Bill. No problem was ever too great to consider, to comprehend, to think of solutions, to discuss. Uh, and the cooperative, the level of cooperation uh, between the leadership of the trade unions and the government was, of course, I think has been unparalleled in Australian political history and probably unparalleled around the world. I can't think of any other place, even places like West Germany or the Scandinavian countries, where there was such a conducive relationship, such a positive relationship between organised labour and the government. And we had our disagreements and sometimes bad ones and he'd get grumpy for a week or two weeks and he wouldn't ring up. Uh, and you get, you get the odd tentative call as the thawing happened, as the, as the iceberg started to melt. <clears throat> but we always kept our eye on the main chance. And the main chance was national advancement and the realisation of the industrial agenda for labour. We always tried to maintain fidelity to those things. Few would realise, let alone know, that at the heart of the anti-inflation constituency was Bill Kelty. Not some corporate whiz or a business council supremo. <clears throat> they wouldn't have had a clue how to break the back of inflation. But Bill Kelty knew that inflation put the biggest monkey on working people's backs as it tore, as it tore away at their savings, at their income, their savings, and saddle them up, of course, with larger mortgages than they need otherwise have. Only with the Labor government could inflation in Australia have been defeated. Without scarifying the workforce in a way we're now seeing in places like Greece and Spain for other economic maladies, but the, the, kind, of, the kind of attack that is mounted uh, and the kind of burden that is borne by ordinary men and women in doing, dealing with endemic inflation is something we avoided. Planned, accord agreed, restraint in nominal wages growth in return for tax cuts flowing from reductions in government spending was affected all to maintain through strong employment growth, uh, 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 concomitant growth in household disposable income. So while we had wages, the wage share and GDP trending down to re-establish investment in Australia, 
we had household disposable income rising because more people in, were in households were in work. Coupled, of course, with a floating exchange rate cushioning the external adjustment and a monetary policy through a reserve bank adopting a medium term over the cycle inflation target. This is how inflation was defeated in Australia and this is why there has been a 36 per cent real increase in wages since 1991. Very few countries you go around the world today and look at the real increase, not the nominal increase, the real increase in wages since 1991. In Australia it's 36 per cent. In the United States, for instance, it's something like three or four. The Liberals were completely defeated by inflation. They didn't know what to do with it. How does Treasurer left me 11 per cent inflation and 10 per cent unemployment? And the worst thing was we had to gift this great and engineered victory to them in 1996. The next worst thing, of course, was that the parliamentary Labor opposition forfeited Labor's ownership of this historic achievement and with it Labor's claim to the doubling of trend productivity and the consequent reduction in inflation and interest rates. Bill pressed on with me in two other milestone reforms. The abolition of centralised wage fixing for a system of enterprise bargaining and, of course, national superannuation. He was also a great champion of minimum rates awards. I think the greatest champion. And another area where Bill and I and the government found common cause, looking after the low paid. Imagine the slaughter had Howard come to office in 1996 with the old centralised wage system still intact. Imagine Reith doing his best or his worst with that structure. The fact is we let unions out of the straitjacket just in the nick of time. A lesser union official, an ACTU secretary, would have gone for the smother and hung on to the old system like a familiar or comfortable old blanket, but not Bill. And does anybody think we would have a national superannuation system unless one visionary Labor leader thought a structural trade-off between nominal wages growth today and a compound dollar tomorrow was not a Labor reform in the highest tradition of Labor reforms? <clears throat> The workforce has Bill Kelty to thank for that leadership. Now, Bill is self-effacing. To be honest with you, he hates all this. I mean, he'll be in good cheer tonight, and you go up to him, he'll, he'll be congenial. <laughs> but he loathes awards, he, lo he loathes ceremony, and most of all, of course, pomp. But there is a measure of justice and importance in his commendation tonight. He gave Australia leadership in its trade unions that few countries have ever enjoyed. That is the simple truth. The modern Australian economy, with all of its flexibility and resilience, is part of his great work. His name is certainly on the maker's label, as perhaps Australia's most exceptional trade unionist of the period. I'm pleased to be here tonight for this, on this important occasion, years after Bill has actually left the ACTU, but it's because he resists such occasions that it's been so hard to have him along and to get him here. But it's important, all of you people, who know what the struggle and the fight is about, to be here and to commend him on his historic work. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure being associated with you.